Hey church, Pastor Adam here, and I want to say thank you so much for stopping by to join us for Church Online today. And, and while we are super stoked that you're hanging out with us this morning, we do want to remind you that really this is just is supplemental. And man, it just cannot replace the local church in your life. And so look, we hope that you are encouraged and, and challenged and shaped by today's message that's being preached. Uh, but, but also, we don't want to be uh, your substitute. Uh, for the local church body that you should be involved in. We really do believe that the local church is God's plan A in reaching the world. So with that being said, please come hang out with us in person uh, one Sunday. If you're in Paducah in the area, come hang out with us to get some rest or find a local Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching church that you can get plugged in and connected to. Uh, Jesus loves the church and, and we love Jesus and, and we believe that we can better serve uh, Jesus, if we love his church well. So, welcome to rest. Good morning, Rest Church! Yay! Welcome, welcome for this particular Palm Sunday. I want to take us on a journey together. It's a journey that begins on a road in a town called Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna and the laying down of palm branches, but it doesn't end there. It's a journey from the heights of anticipation to the depths of despair and ultimately to a hope that rises from the ashes. In a world that's, um, where desperation is all too familiar, where we chase after success, love, and meaning, thinking that each new achievement will finally fill the void we often find ourselves in or we find ourselves searching after, still longing for something more. And that's where kind of our story today and this Palm Sunday begins. I want you to imagine with me Jerusalem, a city that's bloated right now, it's bloated to over 2.5 million people who are there for the Passover week festivities. And they're teeming with anticipation. Bible scholar D.A. Carson describes the emotion that this crowd would have felt and, and this anticipation, this excitement in this way. He says, he says, the Passover feast was to Jews what the 4th of July is to Americans. It was a rallying point for intense nationalistic zeal. This goes to some way in explaining their fervor that they tried to force Jesus to become king. But when Jesus does Grand Theft Donkey, <laughs> the air is electric with hope, liberation, a freedom from oppression. In fact, if we open our Bibles and we go to John chapter 12, and, and we look at verses 12 through 13, we see the anticipation, we see the excitement, we see the fervor firsthand. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. He's just left Bethany. He's just left being anointed by Mary Magdalene following the resurrection of Lazarus. And so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Hosanna, which means save now. The people lined the streets, their voices raised in expectation as they welcomed Jesus into their midst. They believe that he is the one who will deliver them, who will overthrow their oppressors and establish a new kingdom. To reestablish the throne of David. In the branches that they waved, in the cloaks that they laid on the ground before him, 
the people of Jerusalem express this profound human longing, a longing for a Messiah. But what is a Messiah? What, what is it that they are anticipating? What is it that they are desiring? What is it that they're looking for? What is the angst, the emotion that is in this crowd? And in their particular cultural context of the time, it was a deliverer, an anointed one by God. It was this very long-awaited, thousands of years, waiting for this one who was promised in the garden to come deliver God's people from their oppressors, to set again the kingdom of David forever, as God had promised, to lead Israel to freedom and to restore that kingdom. This projection of hope displayed by the, by the crowd and how that they're praising Jesus from the Mount of Olives down to the temple, it, it's not confined to this distant history. When we look at Palm Sunday, we always seem to think about it as it's this journey that happened some 2,000 years ago. But, but the reality is, is it is as live today as it was then. It's alive in our everyday experience. Just as the people in Jerusalem place their hopes in Jesus, we too search for someone or, or, or something to fill our deepest desires, right? We see it in the way that we invest our hopes in political figures. Believing that just one more election, just, just if we could get enough of votes that we can set everything right again. Or we see it in our pursuit of relationships, Thinking that if we find the one, it will make us whole. If we find the one, we can finally have meaning. Our life can finally begin. We see it in this consumer culture where with the next purchase, the, the next experience, the next achievement is always the one that will satisfy us. But... Why did the people of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago want Jesus to be their Messiah? It wasn't just about political liberation from the Roman rule, from the Roman persecution, from the Roman way of life. It was about restoration of a world that had seemingly gone astray. They sought healing from their afflictions, justice from their oppressors, and reassurance that their lives mattered in the grand narrative of history. Isn't that us, kind of? Like, let's be honest, the millennial culture, who we are, and a lot of us who are around about my age, we, we went to work and we thought if we didn't have meaning in what we were doing, if there was no greater meaning, then we couldn't do it. In some ways, that's kind of an extension of our parents. Our parents kind of bred this, you can do whatever, you can have meaning. But that was, that was like us, like the folks there. They wanted to know that their lives had meaning in this grand orchestration that we call history. But here's the thing, is that on, on this story, in this Passion Week, their, their hopes are shattered just a few days later. They welcome Jesus in on this Palm Sunday. They cry out, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the highest. Blessed is he, the king of Israel, they shout. But their hopes are shattered just a few days later when Jesus is arrested. Mark chapter 14, verses 45 through 46. And when he came, Judas... He went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and seized him. 
here in the Mount of Olives. Jesus in desperate prayer to God the Father, anticipating what is to come. The disciples falling asleep next to the tree. Jesus experiencing a medical phenomenon where the capillaries of his um, um, sweat glands are bursting and he is sweating blood. Betrayed by one of his closest confidants. Sold off for just 30 pieces of silver. He's taken, arrested. He stands before the great high priest, Caiaphas. He stands before the fake king of the Jews, Herod. And he stands before the Roman perfect Pilate. And he is convicted of crimes he did not commit. To be led away to be crucified. Luke chapter 23 verses 38, or 32 through 38. Two others were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right, and one on his left, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him that said, this is the king of the Jews. In a moment, the joy of Palm Sunday turns to despair on Good Friday. Can you imagine the guys who have laid everything down? They've left their profession, they've left their family, to follow this carpenter turned rabbi only to see him be put to death. Do you think that they wonder whether they've been I mean, deceived, if they've wasted their lives following this man? This despair yields into desperation. We see this in the narrative of the New Testament. We find the disciples hiding behind locked doors. This despair yields into desperation. Despair is brought forth due to unmet expectations. And when fully grown, it responds with actions of emotion of depression. It's like this. It's like... You are in a situation where you push all the chips to the center of the table, only to find out that there is a hole in the bottom of the canoe. And not only is there a hole in the bottom of the canoe when you get out in the middle of the water, but the, the one life jacket that you had, you left it on the bank because when you went to put it on, the zipper was broke. And, and, oh, by the way, the only ore that you have with you is a star from one that you got on clearance at Ollie's. Is that anyone's life? Have you ever experienced moments like that where you've done the all in, yes, this is the right thing, only to find yourself sinking in the middle of the water? That's the disciples. That's the, that's the picture that we hear. That's the scriptures paint this narrative of Passion Week. It is fraught with, with actions and emotions of desperation in reaction to their misguided expectations of who Jesus was supposed to be or who he was not. We see these actions of desperation not only in the disciples, but we see it in the crowd as Jesus is welcomed into Jerusalem out of the Mount of Olives. We see it from the great high priest and from the Sanhedrin. We see it from Pilate. We see it from Pilate's wife. All of them in response to either who Jesus was or who Jesus was not. But here's the thing. 
Jesus never promised them what they wanted. Jesus also never promised you what you wanted. He didn't come riding on a white horse, leading a victorious army. He didn't come to meet their expectations or ours. He came to meet his. Instead, he came humbly, riding on a donkey. He didn't meet their expectations. He shattered them. And in doing so, he revealed something profound about the nature of his kingdom. The kingdom he came to establish was so much bigger than the existential temple problems that we face. The kingdom he came to establish is one of freedom that can never be snatched away from our hands. Everything about Jesus and the kingdom of heaven is for the desperate. It's for the desperate. He didn't come for the powerful. He didn't come for the prestigious. He he came for the broken, for the outcast, for the desperate. And he calls us to the same desperation. To let go of our pride and our insistence on how things should be done. If the boat in your life is taking on water, he came for you. I want to say that to you because some of you today, might be, you might be new, you might be here, and, and kind of feeling like, man, this is not really our normal pastor's tone. I'm used to being screamed at, not hooked. If the boat in your life is taking on water, he came for you. So what, is, what are these stories of the Passion Week? What do, what do they teach us about our own desperation? They remind us that desperation can push us to the brink, but it can also set us on a new path to freedom. It's all about how we respond. It's all about how we respond. We, we can absolutely find ourselves in despair. We can find ourselves in that canoe out in the middle of the water without a life jacket and that, that clearance or and, and not know if we're going to make it to shore, not know if we're going to make it at all. And it can drive us to isolation. To where we don't want to be around anyone else. We don't want to have conversations about real feelings, about real problems. It can lead us to depression where we want to close the curtains, close the shutters, get under our weighted blanket, and hope that it will pass us by. It can lead us to to bouts of suicide, thinking that this, this, this temporary problem can be solved with this permanent solution. It can lead us to where we begin to manipulate those closest to us and around us in order that we might get what we want, what we desire. Desperation can lead to where we are in in, in bouts of greed or in the accumulation of wealth, resources, so that we can insulate ourselves from future problems. And ultimately, it can potentially lead us to bouts of physical violence if things don't go our way or if people don't respond exactly how we want. Desperation can push us to the brink, but it can also set us on a new path. It's all about how we respond. The opposite of that is we can embrace our desperation. Accept acceptance from God. So many of us are afraid to see our new identity and therefore we bristle against the grace of God. We're constantly fighting the battle between us and Satan saying, I'll never be good enough, but God is looking at you as a child saying, you're already perfect in my eyes. I've already cast your sins from the east to the west. I've already redeemed you. You have a new name. We bristle against this idea. We bristle against this thought. 
we also fail to accept acceptance from others and to find peace in the midst of our struggle. It's the fabric of human experience, the threads of despair that are often interweaven within transformation. It's the addict. Who at the bout of their lowest point has nowhere else to turn but to God. And in their desperation, it becomes the catalyst that serves for their journey to recovery. They don't fight against their desperation. They turn into it and say, it will be the new narrative from which I will rise out of the ashes. Despair can force us to comfort our deepest fears and in the process can catalyze profound personal growth. This is what I, I know some of you hear what I'm saying this morning and, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. As humans, we are conditioned to resist signs of weakness, especially you men. You want to seem like you have it together. You want to appear like you've got it all under control. And all the while inside your head, there's little gremlins running around like, oh! to resist weakness including the raw emotions of desperation yet it is often our most vulnerable moments that we encounter the divine in a new and profound way psychological research supports this this paradox of power in vulnerability This concept is deeply rooted in the work of researchers and authors like Brene Brown, who have extensively explored the dynamics of vulnerability, courage, and authenticity. The paradox lies in the fact that while making oneself vulnerable can indeed expose them to harm, to rejection, it can also lead to profound connection with others fostering empathy, trust, and intimacy. Desperation is not the end. It is the beginning. So if you find yourself in life right now, you're at this crossroads with your job, you're at this crossroads with your finances, you're at this crossroads with this addiction that you face, you're at this crossroads with the marriage that you find yourself in, desperation is not the end, it is the beginning. Mark Batterson said this, he said, Jesus loved praised and rewarded one thing above others. Desperation for God that superseded decorum. I want you to think about that phrase. I know it's a cheap thing that we always go back to when we think about this type of desperation that supersedes decorum, but I can imagine David bringing the Ark of the Covenant in and I can hear Michael, his wife, chastising him and him responding to that. I will become even more undignified than this. We have too many of us who are all about the decorum when coming to God. We're all about the temple, about making sure that we go through the right progression before we enter the Holy of Holies. But here's the thing about the New Testament Jesus. Jesus said, I want to reestablish the tent of David. And essentially he's by saying, I want to reestablish the tent of David. He says, I want to make it where I am accessible to all. I want to make it where the common person can come before the king. And that, that, my friend, is the desperation. So don't let your religion, don't let your decorum stop you from, in your desperation, reaching Jesus. Because Jesus is the great hope of our desperation. 
the one who meets us in our lowest moments and lifts us up. He may not take away the obstacle that is before you, but he will be with you, guiding you and and giving you or us the strength for whatever comes our way. In the gospel narratives, we see Jesus meeting individuals in their most desperate moments. Be it the woman who was caught in adultery with the crowd surrounding ready to cast stones and stone her. Be it Zacchaeus the tax collector who climbed up in a tree in order to see the king of kings. Or be it the woman at the well who who had been a very promiscuous woman who had been married and divorced and had been with other partners. But he, he doesn't offer them judgment, but he offers them hope. A chance for a new beginning. Because this is what we know. Jesus exemplified the theology of hope, demonstrating that God's grace is available to all, irrespective of their past. Accepting our desperation requires us to confront our pride and preconceptions. It asks us to let go of the illusion of control and embrace trust. Trust in God, in his plan, and in his timing. So church, as we journey through this Passion Week, let's remember that our desperation is not the end of our story. It is the beginning of something new, something beautiful. It's an invitation to embrace the hope that comes from knowing that you, we are never alone, that God is with us even in our darkest moments. So let's hold on to that hope. And let us carry through knowing that you are loved, that you are valued, and that you are never forgotten. No matter where you stand today, desperation is not the end, but it is the beginning. When we find ourselves at the end of our rope, when all hope seems lost, that's when we truly can encounter the hope that comes from Jesus. Maybe like the pilgrims that flooded the streets in Jerusalem as Jesus journeyed down the Mount of Olives towards the Temple Mount, you are just fraught with desperation today. Maybe today you need to cry out, Hosanna, save now. Maybe you say, I need a lifeguard. I need someone to come retrieve me and the boat from the center of the lake. I want to tell you that Jesus is the everlasting God. In fact, this morning, on the way to church, I read this. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. His power to the faint, he gives power to the faint and to him has no might. He increases strength. Even youths grow faint and weary and young men shall fall exhausted but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk 
and not be faint. I want to tell you, your desperation in this season is not the end. It is the beginning. It's all about where you put your faith, your hope, your trust. I want to tell you that in Jesus, in the name of Christ, if you put your hope, your trust there in him, you will never be abandoned. You will never be forsaken. You will always have a good shepherd who will take you down the path you need to go. So in this Passion Week, in your desperation, I'm going to invite you right now to meet Jesus with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you've never surrendered your heart, your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity right now. The scriptures tell us that if we would confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Christ died on the cross and was raised on the third day, then we shall be saved. So right here, right now, I want to ask you, have you put your faith in Christ? Have you confessed him as the Lord of your life? If you have not, I want to invite you right now to begin to pray. Maybe you say, Pastor, I I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to do this. There's no special formula. There's no magic set of words. All that requires of us is a contrite and humble heart a spirit of repentance and you can embody that through this dear Jesus forgive me my son forgive me of where I have failed you forgive me of where I have failed to meet your standard in my life I ask today Lord that you would come into my heart that you would come and take over my life today I confess you as the Lord of my life Today, Lord, would you make me new? The scriptures declare that if you pray, asking the Lord for forgiveness, asking him to be the Lord of your life, then you are a new creation. In fact, the Bible describes it like this. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and behold, all things are new. And essentially what that means is your debt your sin, your shame, the things that have plagued you. God the Father no longer sees that as debt against you in your relationship with him. Therefore, you are made new. And so if today you, for the first time ever, really mean it for the first time, surrendered your life, and confess Jesus as Lord, I'm gonna ask you right now, just respond simply by raising your hand at the count of three, just to say, and just let me acknowledge you, let me know, because we wanna make sure that we connect with you. If today you say, I, in my desperation, surrender my life to Jesus for the first time as Lord, count of three, just raise your hand. One, God loves you. Two, you'll never be the same. Three, just right now, raise your hand. If today you surrender your life to Jesus, Okay, with every head now up, I want to tell you that just because you're saved doesn't mean you don't aren't prone to bouts of desperation. Just because you know Jesus doesn't mean you don't go through some things. In fact, what do the apostles teach us? <laughs> if you know Jesus, you're going to go through a lot more than you ever expected. desperation isn't the end for us because we know that we have hope across that Jordan River in the sky. We know that we have hope that sets on a throne for all millennia and that one day we will stand with the angels and we will say holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come again and as long as we have that hope there is no despair that can stop us his army from declaring his good news amen 
so despite our desperation this morning, let us stand and let us declare that we have a great hope in the name of Jesus.